everyone. This is uh, Father Michael Lilly uh, with the Orthodox Experience. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of having a conversation with Father Justin Havens, a uh, priest of the Antiochian Archdiocese uh, in the state of Utah. He's been doing some very good work out there um, with adding to uh, the people, to his flock. And so today we'd like to have a quick conversation with him of uh, telling us a little bit about his uh, approach to uh, evangelization, to, uh, to mission, and to uh, parish growth. Uh, he's uh, been on shows such as uh, Ancient Faith Today, speaking about his um, success or his approach to uh, spreading the Orthodox faith among the mem uh, former members of the um, La uh, Latter-day Saints, the LDS Church, and also on the 10 minute Bible hour, introducing a whole uh, new group of people to the Orthodox faith. So uh, give this a, a good listen to, uh, enjoy, and uh, God bless you all. Hello, Father Justin, Christ is risen. Who is risen? Uh, thanks for being with me today, Father. Um, I've uh, introduced you in my uh, intro here. Uh, I said that, uh, you know, uh, Father Justin's done some good work in, in the state of Utah and that you're an Antiochian priest. Um, but other than that, uh, I, I wanted you to introduce yourself uh, to uh, the people, the subscribers who are watching and, and let, let them know a little bit about your ministry and, and uh, what, what you do there in your parish, um, how things are going, uh, what's going on in your life there. Sure. Thanks, Father. Thanks for making the time. And uh, it's probably my favorite topic to talk about. Oh. Um, because I mean, one of the blessings of being out here is that it's not very entrenched. You know, everything's pretty new. We do have a mix of people in the parishes who are ethnic Orthodox converts. So it keeps it really balanced. And But that renewal of constant new people, it's really a blessing for all of us here. So I've been in Utah. Um, real quickly, I was raised in New York. I'm a New Yorker. Went to college in New Mexico and uh, St. John's College and uh, became Orthodox there. My professor and I uh, was actually baptized the Russian church there or church there. So I learned all the Russian stuff and can serve in Slavonic stuff like that, which was great. And then uh, long story short, uh, um, ended up um, in Colorado, my in-laws are from, and then we ended up in Utah. Um, we came, there was no Russian church here and uh, there was just the Greek church and there was the Antiochian church, which had everybody else. And so I came and directed the choir. I was a school teacher, a special ed teacher before I was a priest. And then uh, we came as a choir director, you know, serving the altar, reader, and then a deacon. And then uh, both priests retired quickly. And so we came about 19 years ago to Utah. So when we came, it was very multi-ethnic, beautiful, but uh, not tons of converts. And then over these past, I'd say I was a deacon, say about 15 years ago, and then priest about 13 years now, downtown at St. Peter and Paul, and it really exploded in growth um, with lots of, again, both in both converts and people that were cradle Orthodox who were kind of inspired by that. And I frankly think that's pretty important in mission work to have both, um, you know, people that are raised in the faith that are inspired by the zeal of, of converts, but also uh, the, this, the experience of people who are raised in the faith kind of tempers the zeal sometimes of the converts. So it's been really important I've seen in the missionary work. And we grew to, I think, when we started this new mission parish in Utah County, where I am now, St. Xenia Church. Um, I mean, we had upwards of, you know, like hundreds of people, you know, 300 people on a Sunday downtown at St. Peter and Paul. And uh, for a while, we had, we had a unique blessing. We had two campuses, one parish just for an interim period. So I, I moved down here to Utah County. And for those who don't know Utah, it's another planet, Utah County. So you have Salt Lake County, which is quite diverse and many more non-Mormons, non LDS people. And then you go to the past the point of the mountain, you're like near BYU, Provo, or 20 minutes south of BYU, Provo, and you're 90% probably LDS people. And so we want five acres in the country wanted to have an Orthodox cemetery and just a place for the kids to run, to have a country campus. Downtown church is very urban um, and such. So for a while we did that. My assistant priest and I switched off and then just naturally it was kind of untenable. So then I became, as of January 1st, full-time here at St. Xenia Orthodox Church. We built here on five acres, beautiful. And then my assistant, Father Paul, is now in charge at St. Peter and Paul. He's the pro Dominos there. So, and uh, it's been great. It's growing downtown still and Thank God, and we're really growing here in our little mission church. And actually, thank God, we actually started a little mission in St. George, Utah. Um, last year or two ago, I started going down there 
doing liturgies and kind of bought a little chapel and Father John Finley picked it up. And then recently Father Josiah's assistant priest, Father Thomas Hernandez moved from California with his nine children. And now there's a full-time priest in St. George, Utah, which is about three and a quarter hours south. And they bought a building and bought property. They're going to build the church. So it's nice to see orthodoxy growing in Utah. So, yeah. I've been, um, I grew up out in Arizona, so I made a few trips out to um, to the Utah, I'd say in George area, I've been to Provo, it's a beautiful country, um, the, the, the people are fantastic, um, so tell us a little more about your your mission, I guess, too, I, I, I remember watching it, uh, um, or hearing you uh, with uh, Tom, Father Thomas Soroka, speaking about your uh, experience with um, I guess they'd like to be called the, the Latter-day Saints, the Church of the Latter-day mm-hmm. Saints, and people converting. And you, you feel like there's a, a hunger for people for something other than that there in, in the Utah area. And, and how have you, um, you know, gone about, you know, ministering to these people? I would think it's it, it really is a majority now. Thank God. I mean, again, downtown, people from all walks of life. And I think you've probably seen as a pastor that people are coming, you know, not from the same, it used to be like maybe former Protestants or, you know, people are coming from paganism and from, you know, baptizing people that were raised, you know, Muslim. I mean, just kind of all walks of life. And so, but now down here being downtown, down here full-time in Utah County, I'd say 80% of the people that come are former LDS. And we do so, I mean, they don't like to be called Mormons and, you know, it might be true, but I really think an important part of mission work is, you know, some things we can't, we just have to be honest about, but some things I think it's, it's helpful to be kind. And, you know, so they like to be called LDS, right? They, even they don't call themselves anymore, better or worse. And, um, and I just find that that missionary approach of St. Innocent of Alaska, you know, trying to find the good things because, you know, Protestant missionaries just beat the heck out of Mormons, you know, and their approach is brutal and unloving. And, you know, the, while the theology is errant, they're an amazing people. And I really, um, after I finished college, I thought about going with Archbishop Anastasios to be maybe be a priest in Albania because I was so inspired by that missionary work. And and uh, but nevertheless, we ended up here in Utah. And I really uh, think that I, it's a bold statement. I think maybe this is the richest mission field in America because people are really hungry. Um, there's a lot of large amount of attrition in the LDS church I think with the rise of the internet, the ability to research some of these claims. But so I'm very honest about you know what I think is false. But they're amazing people. I mean, they really are. They're kind people. They're naturally moral. They naturally love families. They love, it's, I grew up in New York, you know, <laughs> everyone tells you what they think, but here everyone is so kind. Like the mayor helped us with the building this church. And the, I mean, again, predominantly LDS. I mean, we're, I'm a, I'm an alien walking around in my cassock, you know, in my beard, but they're always wanting to talk. They always want to, and they, I get ignored in New York and California here. They stop. What are you father? What are you? Can I come to your church? I mean, they're really amazing and they really have this kind of i don't know like a skeleton and i feel like if they find orthodoxy with the meat they make the best orthodox christians how do I, please come to church they have a they have a natural humility to the like to the church like how do i give how do i tithe i want to come to the services i want to repent i want to and so yeah that i mean they're not christians in the same way we are of course there's huge differences but um it's really like i think it's the beginning of a dam about to really explode i mean we're barely reaching out we're just here our domes are beautiful gold domes you can see it off I-15 the interstate and people just come and when we started here I don't know we had like 30 people and I think now in just the past few months I mean I think this Sunday we had 110 you know um and it's the church is already we just finished building it it's already too small so we're gonna have plans to build a bigger church in time but uh no it's a really I call it the beautiful problem you know so it's new people every day um but like I said I said the vast majority we did about I think about 20 baptisms at the end of Lent between the Saturday and Lazarus. And we still, have, I think we have 15 again, more catechumens again. Uh, you know, there's, there is a real hunger, a real hunger for the original church. You know, this idea of there never was an apostasy, which of course they believe, you know, church history, apostolic succession, apostolic doctrine. And I think the life of the church too, not just like the academic theology, but the practical everyday life of a lived in serious Orthodox Christian appeals to them as well. How do you uh, get them uh, to come? Is it by word of mouth? I know I, I obviously with my YouTube page, I, I do a lot of work um, and reaching out uh, online. And but that that fruit is there, but it's also strife with many issues. You know, like you just said, the Protestant missionaries that beat these people up. And and I think uh, sometimes our in our 
just true of our own Orthodox faith while online. If you've ever right. been so had the sad opportunity to read somehow how we, we minister to people online, you know, some of our faithful are not the most kindest um, reaching out to people. So how, how is it that you're getting such large amounts of catechumens people the church is it but are they your people missionizing are they inviting people or, or what what's your uh i guess tell me what you do father to, to get people to show up at well, church. I, yeah it's, it's a good question i mean i'm really thankful for the for two words i was given when i was ordained um, by metropolitan joseph who ordained me um you know and uh deacon and priest and when i was made a priest and i was full-time he told me he says listen you're a full-time priest i expect you to do services every day you know, and I, I, I was kind of, I thought that was what he told everybody, but no, in my circumstance, I do them every day. So I started doing services morning and night because I am, you know, I'm, I'm married I'm, and I have 10 children yes. um, and they all chant. So I have no excuse. I have chanters, you know, I have, so I just started doing it. Um, and I was really struck by how it was kind of lonely at first um, because, you know, of course people came on the weekends and um, I had read about St. Alexei Mechev who was uh, in Russia and his of course, his son, St. Sergei Mechev as well. Um, same thing. He started doing the services daily and nobody came. And they mocked him, even other priests. But he just said, keep doing it, keep doing it. And a holy abbess, who's uh, really helped us over the years, she told me at the beginning, just do the services daily, no matter what, and pray. And like your personal prayer rule is really important. And I guess that's like a, that's like a mystical answer for the first part, I would say. But I really think it's true. And I think overlooked often is that like the prayer of the priest and the uh, dedication even if it's only one or two people because after a while we had a little chapel downtown and it was five people and ten people and then often there'd be 30, you know 30 or 40 people on a weekday and i've always done and even here now um i kind of kept that model so we have um i have liturgy and vespers almost every day um and uh and i found that 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 has been essential a success i would say of downtown the church St. peter and paul and also saint xenia now um, in, in a mystical sense of asking the Lord of the harvest to send people, you know, because, um, you know, we don't, we have a good website now, which now practically, I think that's super important. The world's very wired after COVID and things like that. And I'm not really into like live streaming and stuff like that, but I think just having a good website because people in Utah, of course, there's a certain risk to go to church for the first time outside of Mormonism. You see what I mean? So they really check it out first, you know, so they want to get lots of information. And that's where they, I think the vast majority find it that way. Um, our domes kind of cool you can see them from the highway and uh i've had people just see them that was my goal like a lighthouse in the midst of the sea of this world to see them and they just come and said they want to see the church so i'd say every day um and i live i own a little uh, half acre in the corner so i live a, i can walk 30 seconds to church every day and so when i'm here i mean there must be 50 cars a day that stop and want to see the church and we have some beautiful iconography started you can see an iconography from serbia if i'm fine and um so I think it's kind of like if you build it, they will come um, in some sense. So I'd say that's the spiritual aspect. You know, the internet for sure is the way they come the most. I'm not very savvy. I have a wonderful man in our parish um, who does like the social media stuff without getting, I don't have social media. I'm kind of a, um, too busy. I don't want to get caught up. He's great at it. So kind of just beautiful pictures kind of draw the, you know, the beauty will save the world, you know, to draw them in to suspend judgment maybe. So I think that's huge. Um, also, I think just the priest being around the community, I think um, walking in his cassock and, you know, being around and answering questions and, um, you know, just being a part of the community in some sense. And then our people, I think you mentioned that. I always tell people, you know, like that's, that's the Holy Spirit. It has to be not just, you know, like, like today's feast, mid-Pentecost, right? Like rivers of living water will be flowing from your belly. Like, you know, like the after Pentecost is all saints, right? That's the fruit of it. So I tell people it can't just be me in my cassock walking around, like you have to be different at work and at school and not ashamed of your faith. Cause Mormons are very bold about their faith. You know, we don't go door to door um, because we respect people's freedom, but we often people, you know, like for instance, in old country, people usually put their cross as men inside their shirts. But I often bless people if they're not ostentatious to wear their cross out here because it's so unique and they don't know the cross. They kind of are grossed out by the cross, you know? So it's kind of a evangelical tool, um, but mostly just, Make your sign of the cross when you bless your food. At, or I mean, at work or at a restaurant. I mean, I have like five or six families who found the faith because one of our parishioners at a restaurant took a minute to do their prayer, did their cross and blessed their food. And then it started a conversation and now we baptize them. <laughs> so I think those you know little ways are important too. So I think the combination of people really living the faith, because again, if people come, what are they coming to? 
You know, I think that's a big concern. You know, we can get shiny like the Protestants in some way and have a really slick plan to get people to the church, but then it's a question of, are they walking into a place that's hospital where people are actually being healed? I mean, you know, it's like we read nice books. It's the original church. Yeah, it's great. But if people aren't repenting, if people aren't like confessing and communing and living the life of the church, at least struggling with it, then it can be really, I've seen it be like people like disappointed. Not that we're all saints or something. You know what I mean? But the sense of they like, well, I thought this was original church. This is, you know what I mean? So I tell my people all the time, you live it, fall and get up, like be serious about it. So, I mean, people might accuse me of being zealous or something, but I just, I don't think it's monastic or extraordinary just to be serious about coming to church as much as you can, you know, plugging in where you can, fasting as you can, and just making it your whole life, you know? And uh, I think that's why our people are really, really dedicated. And I think that's why it's growing too. Well, that's wonderful. I can, well, I can. I can pass to a lot of what you're saying, you know, uh, about living the faith. I've had some people that I've brought into the church and they, you know, it's kind of humbling. They took me to side and said, Father, you know, the things that you are, uh, you know, you've taught us and the, and the piety that you've, you, you've shown us to, to try to kind of live out. You know, we don't have, I don't really see a whole lot of examples of it. Um, and, 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 and that hurt, you know, yeah. but it was true, you know, so, you know, because you know, people who were, maybe more comfortable, uh, just live in a kind of a normal, I guess what you would say, kind of a lukewarm, normal orthodoxy. Um, they, they right. kind of, people end up getting discouraged when they come to the church because they don't see it being lived out the way they read about or way they, uh, you know, they see it uh, in some places online, you know, and um, there was a, a priest, uh, you, you may have known him, he was uh, with me, at, uh, he was a dean at the seminary I went to, Archpriest Alexander Addy, uh, yeah, I, I knew him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he too took this similar approach. It was, you know, daily service. He had daily services every day. Um, you know, he had a very vibrant church in Louisville, Kentucky for that reason. I, I, he, he attests that. He, he says, like yourself, he says, this is, um, you know, really what strengthened me and I think grew my parish. And so I know that's a big ask for a lot of our own clergy out there, that especially those that work and um, you know, large family, but, but I, I appreciate your example for you doing what you do. Um, you said something about, you know, the, the church you built, you know, the, the, the beautiful domes, uh, uh, the iconography. You know, I, I gave a talk about evangelization in my own parish once, and I know this is a kind of a maybe controversial to some, but I truly believe that, it, you know, historically it has shown that the beauty of the church and the traditional architecture, the iconography, these yep. things are evangelization uh, you know, tools uh, of the church, you know, beautiful singing. And I know it may seem like so for some superficial, but what is your take on this? You know, the, in more of a, a traditional living out, the traditional living out of our faith, not just, you know, of course, the piety, the, the prayers, but on the outward experiences. Uh -huh. Does it make a difference there in your, in your experience there in your ministry? Oh, I think it's huge. I mean, I think you have to be practical. I mean, I think obviously you can only do what you can do. You know, I mean, you know, I know in St. George, for instance, the mission, we started there, we bought a little chapel, it was quickly too small. And now they've, they're renting a larger space kind of in a strip mall. And, but everyone's aware of the reality of that. And they already bought new property and there's a vision, right? There's a vision for beauty. And so they're doing the, what they can do. Um, you know, in downtown in Salt Lake City, our parish was a, was a former Orthodox synagogue. So it was, it, we made it really beautiful. So it had a sense of like, you're downtown, but you come in and it really felt like heaven. And I think that's super important. And I think one of our goals in building this new church here, and it really is spectacular down here. The mountains are spectacular and we have five acres and um, we have the cemetery. It's going to be uh, um, first Orthodox Christian cemetery in Utah um, for all the churches. And uh you know, so the, the the goal was to have it be like kind of a, not a monastery, but a sense of the world could take a take a breath from the world. So I think like even the whole complex, when you go to a monastery, there's a feel of like laying the world aside. And I feel like we need that as the times get crazier. So this five acres, my feeling was to make it kind of a bubble of grace. And I think absolutely beauty. I mean, it wasn't cheap. I mean, building this church was between between the the. Um, building the church. And I mean, it was like almost $3 million. I mean, the church was $2.3 million and it's not a big church. I mean, it holds maybe packed like sardines standing 200 people, you know, but we have a little hall attached to it and just everything's so expensive, but we didn't sacrifice beauty and the domes are 70 feet and they're spectacular. And every day I walk over there and it's, I mean, it's stunningly beautiful. Like, and it's, I kind of feel like you know, Dostoevsky talks about that, how beauty will save the world. And I think it's an answer to this over-rationalism, right? Like a lot of people like, 
like I'm Mormon. I'm never going to be not Mormon. So I am. I'm evangelical. I'm never going to, you're not going to break in logically. But I think if they can just see the beauty of it, it kind of, it kind of pops the bubble in some way, or it, they come into the church and see the iconography and they, it, all of a sudden it kind of shocks them with beauty. And I think they can suspend judgment maybe for a moment and actually open their hearts and think is maybe something other than this, what I think is true. And I think that's unique to the Orthodox faith, that beauty. Um, so I'm thankful that, you know, and I'm thankful to, I begged and borrowed everywhere across the whole country. And we, this church is, we paid off. And we have no mortgage, which is a miracle. I mean, it's a miracle. And now it's too small. It's a good problem. You know, we call it the beautiful problem, but I guess it's a testament to that. I could have done a lot cheaper, could have a much bigger church and be more utilitarian. And again, not judging anyone else that does that. I'm just thankful that we took this approach, even in the littlest things from the, the rug to the tile to the, the icon stands and to the things and just we live in a throwaway world i feel like a disposable world and that can creep into the church sometimes and so i'm thankful that we went with things that just feel sturdy and chunky i'm not sure i can explain that well but like with wood and other things so it feels like like in the old world old country you go there those stones you know churches in serbia is that you know it's been burned to the ground multiple times during invasions but they just the stones are still there and the walls are still there. They just rebuild the wooden roof and keep going. You know, that sense of stability in this crazy world. So I totally agree with you. Again, everyone's circumstances are different. I understand everyone can't do it, but I think it's better to sacrifice size and other things to make something really beautiful. And like you said, chanting. I mean, it's, it should be really beautiful. Like, you know, if, a bad, if you have a bad icon, what do you do? You burn it, right? We don't, it's not like everyone gets a trophy. You know what I mean? Like bad icons would be terrible, right? So it's like, it has to be beautiful. I think same with church singing. I tell people like on a Sunday, if you want to sing along and your terrible voice, like go ahead, do it quietly. <laughs> but you know, like, but it, it has to be like heaven. But the vestments should be beautiful. These things should be um, not for, because it reflects heaven, right? And people don't have that in their lives. So um, overwhelmingly, I agree with you there. And again, I don't think it's controversial in the sense of maybe some people can't afford it. Well, of course we just do what we can. And we certainly can't afford much, but um, I do think there's a direct connection between emphasizing that and people experiencing the kingdom of God and, and, and coming. You know, so. um, Father, you know, I, I, uh, I'm in a vastly different part of the country than you. I'm in uh, Northeast Ohio. It's, it's seen its better days for sure. And uh, we were in an old parish, uh, you know, it's over a hundred years old, but oh, glory to God, you know, outside is a little deceiving. It looks old and ran down inside. We, we have, a beautiful, beautiful church. Uh, I just saw. I just saw some pictures from your parishioners who were just here yesterday at my house. And, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes. And I thank you from uh, my parishioners. Used to be your parishioners, and we have that connection. So, uh, what a blessing! But I've seen pictures of your church, and it's beautiful inside. Yeah. And so, ministering to uh, I'm a, probably a dim different demographic. Where are the, the the realities of our our locations are different, but. Uh, the one thing I think that uh, um, we've been able to grow on in my parish, and not to the extent that you have, but maybe one day, uh, God willing, uh, with with uh, faithfulness, is uh, the one thing is our community. What I, I stress is community. You know, you, it, you would, it's um, to me, uh, there's some Orthodox churches that don't do a good job of, of being welcoming. And there's some Orthodox churches that do, don't do a well job of instilling a, a, a family environment where, where, you know, you come to church. Uh, this is your your family. This is your community, and this is what I've since I've been here. I've been here six years. Been trying to build, and and it's shown some fruit. So, uh, um, it's not about me. But what do you do? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And what and what? How do you build community? How do you find ways to to you know make the community more than just a place where you can come pray? No, I think that's really important. I think that's one thing I forgot to mention is. I think that's absolutely essential. I mean, you don't come to church to find friends. I tell people often, you know, Mormons are good at that, but mm -hmm. it's invariable that if you come and give your life to this, you're going to find the best friends you've ever had in your life because you share the same things, right, at, at heart. Um, I think that's huge. I've been to lots of churches. My wife and uh, we traveled a bit and visit family. We visit parishes. And I'm having gone as a priest somewhere and no one's said hello to me. Nobody. You know, my wife's gone in some places and just it was the parish feast day and everyone's there and no one invited them over to the hall for food. I mean, just, you know, I guess maybe we're more sensitive to it, but imagine someone who's intimidated for the first time. I mean, it's, I remember one guy, he came into the church downtown, he walked in and I was sensing towards the back and he kind of just like started to panic and like turned and ran out because here's this guy in full vestments swinging this thing and he had no idea really. Um, so I think it's, 
it is different than the old country. I mean, you can't be afraid of that. And so, you know, in the sense of like having someone at the door, I've learned it's really important here. You know, when someone comes in, they're nervous, you know, and having them like, you know, welcoming them and, you know, not being partisan about it, but just making them feel comfortable here. We have some chairs in the back. You can feel free to sit or stand and just giving them away, you know, like we don't have pews. Um, we stand, but we, I give them a liturgy book at the beginning. It's just something that people know what to do just to follow along the liturgy at the beginning. I don't like that for too long, but I think having something like that, but being inviting, like, I mean, to go and then someone could leave and then never talk to them again. I said, you better grab them. In fact, I tell my parishioners, you got to talk to five new people today. That's your obedience in the, in the fellowship meal, you know, and, and we always have a fellowship meal afterwards. We always have. And uh, that's huge. You know, everyone shares, brings food and we spend time. And I'm really of the opinion that you have to have community. Like you said, it can't just be like, hey, you know, see you next Sunday. No. And like, I think having daily services and being, it creates that kind of feeling as well. So it's awesome. I mean, we have a very undersized hall, but we're packed on Sunday and people stay for that. And they have a cup of coffee and they might have a beer together if they're not fasting. And they, and these people link together and the kids play outside and their kids can play. And I think that it has to be a holistic life. Right. It can't just be like, here's my, you know, I go to church. Like one priest said, you know, a lot of people, they, they live in the world and go to church once in a while. We're supposed to swim in the church and from that place, we go out and meet the, right. It should be our whole life. And um, so I've just seen that happen even here in Pace in this new little church is we have so many families with so many children and we are, I feel really close to them that is, as their priest. And I really, and I don't mean that I really love them. And I feel like they're my, like, friends you know and not, not, i don't tell them my problem you know what i mean but i feel like we spend time and they i live nearby they're at my house all the time and i open my home and they can i just feel this sense of love and connection and not distance and i think what you're saying is so important and in a short period of time we built a great community where i can we genuinely love each other and sacrifice for each other and i think that's part of the liturgy right i think it's changed the participation in the liturgy it's changed when there's conflict you know, stupid little conflicts and the ability to forgive those and work through them has ruined m many a parishes if you can't do that. So I, I, I we, we do big things like an agape. We had anyway, all this property, we had a huge bonfire. We had people over, we had neighbors, we had people and folk dancing. And, you know, we did fireworks on New Year's Eve, you know, and it was just, I think, you know, doing those things is essential. And like, like you said, I've been to some parishes, beautiful, everything's nice. And then it's like, it's over, it's over. And people don't seem connected or it seems like they just kind of want to get out of there. Um, and I understand people have busy lives and stuff, but I, I, I tell catechumens that a requirement, part of catechumen it is um, you have to hang out. If you just take off after liturgy, you know, you, you know I'm not going to baptize you because how are you going to find a sponsor? How are you going to find people that you to help you when you're struggling? And um, so that's, I a hundred percent agree with you. Thanks father. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for all that. Well, um, I, I think that uh, just, just to recap of things we talked about was, uh, you know, the, the importance of, you know, the services, the importance of, you know, the beauty of the of the service in the temple and our, our community and and being um, uh, like you said, using St. Innocent's model of, of, of being, you know, taking what we can uh, from from the, from people's past and using it, but and then ultimately directing them when it's when possible down the Orthodox path. And this is. And these are the common of the main things that have made you successful. Um, what do you, uh, what would you, can you leave, give us a, a final word, you know, an encouragement uh, uh, to, to both maybe pastors and also to, to laity within churches on, on uh, you know, what you see that is most needed today to, to get people to, uh, you know, follow Christ in the Orthodox church to come, come and be members of the church uh, who maybe are struggling with that right now. Well, I would say one of the many things that was, destructive in COVID was this isolation, you know, isolation from God and isolation from the church, isolation from each from people, you know, and I think that that's demonic. And I think that we need each other more than ever. And I think with, you know, I'm not an apocalyptic guy, but it's pretty clear the world is a mess. And I think that as the darkness gets greater, the light of Christ shines more. And so I tell people, don't be afraid, just like, this is the best time ever to be an Orthodox priest. This is the best time ever to be an Orthodox Christian. Oh, it's hard. It was so great. God could have chosen us to be born in different times, but no, this is like the time to, for bravery, you know? So I'd really encourage people to be courageous and to go all in, you know, not to be lukewarm, to go all in with the supporting their priests and supporting their mission. And for the priests, even if you're in a little mission with 10 people or you have a huge cathedral, just us priests can always work on ourselves, you know? And I think that 
sometimes when our inner spiritual life isn't going too well, we can focus on outward stuff at the expense of our inner life, maybe. So I always come back to that. Like, I know for myself, I can't neglect myself. I can't give what I don't got, you know, so to speak. Um, and I expect the same from the people. But I think, I really do think that as the world gets crazier, having a community, a real deep community, not, you know, prayer and rejoicing and singing and dancing and having a beer together, but also weeping together. And we just buried a little baby behind our church yesterday that was born, little seraphim. And it was just beautiful and the fellowship afterwards and i feel like you know in the old country they they're born together they live together they die together and we're so transient and not connected so i feel like that's our mission too is just to connect people and to simplify your life and try to get off our phones and you know take a walk and just live a simple life as, as much as possible in this this crazy world i think if we do that if we're faithful and i'm really i think we need to live the way the fathers say and I think it's shocking to me that's controversial somehow. Um, orthodoxy is the faith of the fathers and the patristic witness. And, and for me, that's what I always go back to is, you know, how did they live? How did they live in every orthodox country through communism and everything? And just faithfulness, faithfulness to God. It's not rocket science, you know, and uh, I don't think we have to invent anything new. We just have to humble ourselves and try to live it that way. And by no means do we do it. Um, it might seem, you know, we have a beautiful church and there's numbers. We got plenty to work on. I don't want to make that mistake. And I have a lot to work on personally, but I'm really encouraged by conversations like this with you. And um, I went on a family vacation recently and uh, visiting some other parishes and mission priests I've never met before and just seeing their struggles. I really think we need each other, you know, um, we have the same fronima and mentality. We need to stay connected and pray and our family spend time together and, and parishes. I think that's, at least it's really helpful to me to have a brotherhood like that of priests and faithful people. So. Thank you, Father. Thanks for all, all your, you know, your wise words, your uh, sharing with us about your experiences there. And, um, I, you know, I pray God continue your, you know, you, the, the success you've had there. Um, and, uh, you know, that your, your, the faithfulness of you and your community continue. And um, I, uh, I thank you for your time, Father. No, I really appreciate it. And Father, if you pray for us, we're, Metropolitan Joseph is coming to consecrate our church. We just found out. Oh. Um, you're more than welcome. I'll send you an invite, but it's going to be July 15th in the evening, Friday, July 16th, Saturday. And we'll have many visiting priests. Maybe you can come. And uh, anyway, it would be nice and it'll be beautiful. Kind of a, it'll be a monumental day in the life of our community. And uh, we have a lot of do to pray for us. We have two months to get the cemetery ready. Everything be blessed. So it's a lot, but uh, we'd ask everyone's prayers. God give you strength, Father. Thank you, Father. All right, Christ thank is you. risen. Truly is risen.